we've been doing. We've been going by each oh, department. Council President, Council President, just let me start the meeting before you. Oh, I thought you did. Yeah, no, 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 not yet, sure. not yet. No, no, no. <laughs> Pretty sure you told her to get started. <laughs> no, I said, I'm, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We are on the record. Today is Wednesday, the second day of February in the year 2022. This is a special caucus meeting of the Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 4 p.m. start. The clock on my cell phone is showing 4.07 p.m. May we have a roll call for the commencement of this special caucus meeting. Councilperson Ridley. Councilperson Prinzeri will not be here. Councilperson Baggiano. Councilperson Soleil is not here yet. Councilperson Solomon is not here yet. Councilperson Gilmore. Councilperson DeGees. Councilperson Rivera. And Council President Waterman. Here. We have six members in attendance at, six council members in attendance at 4.07 p.m. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss the Department of Public Safety. In addition, at the time of its preparation, the, the notice of this meeting was similarly disseminated on Thursday, January 27th in the year 2022 at 3.20 p.m. to the Municipal Council, Mayor, Business Administrator, Corporation Council, and the local newspapers, so I can certify as our total compliance with the Sunshine Law. Council President. Thank you, Sean. Well, Director, I'll tell you our format. What we've been doing is going through each department, each division, and you can explain to us each division what the responsibilities are and, you know, um, your goal, how you intend to approve it. And then after that, we'll ask the council if they have any questions after each division. It's easier to do it that way. This way here, we don't go through it all because some of the questions they forget and it goes back and forth, we'll stay focused that way. Okay? Yes. Okay, so you could start with the director's office and then go down to quality of life and so forth and so on. Uh, the director's office is just my office and my administrative support staff. Uh, not much to talk about there. Uh, it will be getting smaller if all goes as plans this year. We'll be moving several of the functions we've been doing as pilot programs, the body camera management, the CCTV management, we plan on moving that out, and at the same time, we plan on taking some of our employees that are in there and using them to do some new initiatives in the new city command center, re resident response that we plan to do, and also possibly in a new park at traffic division. So there's not much uh, going on with mine. We have, uh, I don't have, sorry, I don't have that in front of me anymore because Sean has mine, but there's me. Oh, perfect, thanks. Is me, Billy O'Donnell, is the management and administrative assistant. He runs the almost the entire fire side. He's been getting involved in doing the contractual negotiations. Uh, the Division of Quality of Life is run by Jay Cudnut, Mary Peretti, Parking, Greg Gears, OEM, Robert Baker, Communications, Steve McGill, our fire chief fire, and uh, Director Tawana Moody, the police. And in the office itself in support, the deputy director box is blank. That's because we've already mentioned Billy O'Donnell and we didn't want him in two places. Uh, Lauren's the administrative assistant. There's Billy anyway. Somehow they managed to put him in the management. The next three names down, Mar Maribel, Patricia, Kelly Costigan, Monique, are all fiscal, or police and fire. They're the fiscal people. Uh, Elise Jordan Gibbs, he runs the police off-duty program. Uh, Christopher Kearns is the two things I just mentioned, the CCTV body camera coordinator. He's been the project manager for those two projects for the last several years. Crystal Fonseca is responsible for all discipline, all civilian discipline across the entire public safety division. Uh, the reason for that is prior to this, people did discipline in different places differently, and we thought that was unfair. So we put Crystal in charge, and now no matter where in public safety you are or what your job is, she's in charge of your discipline, and her job is to ensure that everyone is treated equally across the division. So if you commit an offense in one division, uh, in parking, say, it's treated exactly the same as if somebody tr commits the same offense in communications. So her job is to ensure that there's a fairness and uh, equality across the board. 
And then John Sabo is our violent crime coordinator. He coordinates, he's a previous street crime captain. We brought him back and he coordinates with the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office, the Homicide um, Squad, the State Police, the Feds, and the Violent Crime Initiative. And his job is to make sure that nothing falls between the cracks in any investigations and that everybody is aiding each other in investigations. So uh, that's my entire staff and that's the entire office. Councilperson Ridley, just, you need the mic. We need to have it on the record as well, so you just pass the mic. Okay. For the uh, deputy director position, you mentioned Bill again. Is, so is Bill the management assistant or is he the deputy director? Uh, he's filling both jobs right now. So his title, his civil service title is management assistant and we don't have a deputy director. So for a while when I started, we had Jerry Calla. Jerry Calla retired, he was replaced by Director Moody. She filled in that job, but it was um, incompatible with running the police department on a full-time basis. So when we moved her to the police department and she took over as the director of police and took over the police department, we never filled that job. And Billy from management assistant just stepped up and he's been running both jobs. So it's vacant, deputy it's vacant, director? Right, yeah, it's vacant right now. Okay. Oh, and since you bought a vacancy, thank you, Councilperson. At the bottom of the page, you'll see public safety complex, right? That's also vacant. There's no name. Uh, later this year, we hope to be opening the public safety complex over in what I call City Hall West. It's been an eight-year project, but we've been committed to moving all of our facilities to that part of the city. Uh, when we open it up, someone is going to have to take over that complex. It's going to be... building, everything else. So we're going to put a security plan in and someone is going to have to take over the security and management of that entire little city hall complex west, as I call it. Well, one person in charge. I mean, obviously the police department is going to have to assign people permanently, you know, for security. Uh, we already have some security in some buildings. The, we have a contract for our building with they have to maintain it for 10 years after, you know, for 10 years after it's built, but we'll have to start getting ready to take it over ourselves. But at first, like anything else, we're going to just put one person in charge and see what we need. So we'll have to take the initial jobs out of existing resources. The cone of silence. Well, <laughs> so that's the, that's the only other um, empty one. So uh, the vacancy. The vacancy uh, for deputy director, um, is there any way that Will, Will can just move up? Um, is it open? Uh, are we advertising it? Is it a salary attached to it? Uh, could, Will, could Will move up? Um, basically, if everybody remembers, we moved Director Moody over, then got hit with COVID, <laughs> then got hit with everything else. Uh, so we haven't been advertising or hiring anybody. Uh, Will O'Donnell, as you said, just stepped up. And his responsibilities worked very closely with that job. So he stepped up and just began doing it. And he's been doing it for well over a year now on an efficient basis. So we ha we'd either have to talk about posting it, or it might be worth talking about combining those two jobs and not paying two people where one person has been doing it. That was my next point. OK. I guess my question is right. Tawana's, Tawana's job changed, but her title never changed. She always had the title of director of police, right? So to me, director of police and deputy director are two different things. Uh, as far as civil service titles, yes. Okay. So, so in your mind, she was the deputy director, even though her title was director of police. No. Uh she was the director of police, to be clear, civil service. She had the full complement of duties of a director of police. However, she also, when that job became empty, kind of like Billy, stepped up and began doing some of the duties in that job. Now, there's two reasons. Uh, one, she wanted to learn them, and we wanted her to learn them. And the odds of, if I'm not here, she can take over, because she was the next person in 
the chain of command. So if I go on vacation for a week, she knows what these jobs are and can just step up and take over the job. So she kept her civil service title and job and began to learn the deputy director job and to learn how to fulfill those duties. And she could do anything I can do right now, without a doubt. And then the director of police job was expanded. It remained the same civil service title, but when we decided not to replace the police chief and to expand the director of police job to the complete control of the police department, no longer did she have time, or no longer was it feasible, even at her work ethic, <laughs> for her to do that and learn. It wouldn't have been fair. So at that point, we told her to concentrate on the director of police job. One thing she still does, though, she's still the number two in the entire public safety division, and if I'm not available, she is the next person in the chain of command, even though her title is director of police. Okay. I don't expect you to know these off the top of your head, but after this meeting, can you send us the, uh, the salaries for your office as well? I already have from the council president uh, the director's office, the director of parking, and Bob Baker's people over in the thing. So, director, with that said, do we plan on making, do we plan on having a civilian fire director then? No. So, Director Moody is going to fill in that gap, like you, when you just stated that she's the number two, so she's going to be the number two both in police and fire? No. No, she's, what we're doing is, uh, she's the director of police. She's running the police department now. If I'm not here, though, she steps up and becomes the acting public safety director because she's the number two in the chain of command. On the fire side, we have a uniform fire chief, but we don't, so we don't need a fire, a fire director. The uniform fire chief reports directly to me. So if the uniform fire chief uh, retires, we plan on making a fire chief? Oh, we, we do what we did the last time. We'd make an acting chief immediately. Civil service regulations would require that we then post that job because unlike the police side, the fire chief is still a civil service title. So we would have to make an acting chief, post a job, um, obtain the highest three candidates, and what we did last time was the mayor and myself uh, then held a interview with the top three candidates and he selected a candidate uh, based on whether they resided in the city, uh, years of experience, et cetera. So that's what we would do. Uh, I don't need a phone. Why'd you pass it? <laughs> Isn't the, right now, the situation of director illegal under state law? Pardon me? Is the acting director under state law illegal? Or chief or director? Direct, direct which director? Myself or the director? No, not you. I'm talking about Modi. Isn't uh, Director of police? Yeah. Yeah, we don't believe so. Well, what does the state law say? Well, she has no authority no, as a civilian because she's a civilian. No, we, we have any decisions. She is the director of police. She has a police chief responding, to, reporting directly to her, Deputy Chief Nicole, Nicole LaFleur. If decisions have to be made that by law can only be made by a uniformed person, Deputy Chief Nicole LaFleur is available, as are multiple other talented chiefs. Uh, we have a, we've talked about the structure we were putting in with the Attorney General's office, with the county prosecutor, with everyone else, and we have not received any legal challenges, so we're confident in it. There's a lot of uh, questions on this whole thing, and I'm going to talk to you about it privately. Okay. Any more questions on the director's division? Let me ask you something about um, Chris, too, who handles the um, disciplinarian. Okay. Um, she should have... Um, some type of log or some type of data on if there's a recurring incident with a, an employee, she should have it, right? Should I, she, she be aware of recurring? Yeah. She's aware of every discipline. Oh, she is. Incident. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely, yeah. And if it's recurring, she should have the information. She would have it. So, okay, that's all I, I just so, want to know. I mean, just to make yeah, it Yeah, I just want to know. use a recent incident. So okay. any, what used to happen was each director would handle discipline themselves. Okay. And for a lot of reasons, we weren't happy with the way that was okay. going. So we centralized it under Crystal. Okay. If a, a infraction is observed, mm -hmm. it's reported to Crystal. Okay. Crystal does the investigation and prepares the charge sheet. Mm -hmm. It's handled by an outside adjudicator and then eventually comes to me for the imposition of discipline if they're found 
substantiated. Mm -hmm. So this way, Crystal's not the judge, jury, and executioner either. Mm -hmm. She just ensures that the investigation is done appropriately mm -hmm. and that everyone is treated equally and that our recommendations are consistent across the board. As opposed to, if you come in an hour late in one place and it was your first offense, then your proposed discipline should be exactly the same as if you came in an hour late any place else. Now, the one exception to that are the uniform members who contractually have to go through a different process. That depends. Okay. So the, I'll, the question was if it was a sexual assault or a racial incident, Crystal would handle it too. Okay. That depends. Now, uh, a sexual assault or anything that rises to the level of a possible crime has to be reported to the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office. They would then do an initial investigation, even though it's employee on employee, it could potentially still be a crime. They would do an investigation and they would decide if they're gonna charge it as a crime or if they don't feel it rises to that level and they're gonna return it to us for discipline. At that point, if there is any aspect, and the two you mentioned are two of the many, that fall within the equal employment opportunity protections that are afforded to every employee, Crystal would place what we call a placeholder charge. She would document what happened, but then she would turn the investigation over to our equal employment opportunity investigators who are experts in uh, allegations of a sexual nature, allegations of, and we're dealing with some of them now, allegations of a racial nature. They would do an investigation and report and return it through HR to us for discipline. So because of the expertise involved and federal law, which requires that these things be handled differently, that's the way that would go. But the ultimate discipline would eventually come to us, and Crystal would be the one who documents it to ensure that everybody's treated equally. Council President, before uh, we move on, I just wanted to record Councilperson Soleil present at 4.20 p.m. So we now have seven council members present at 4.20 p.m. Thanks. Uh, Director Shea, um, I don't know the last time you spoke to Crystal, but you know, that sounds amazing that that is the process on paper, but that's not what's happening. And there have been unequal punishments meted out for similar, if not identical infractions, and it's created a toxic workforce environment and it needs to be addressed. And I feel as though Crystal's hands are tied um, when it comes to certain individuals that would get infractions, you know, um, they're not, they, they have, they've been told to ease up on certain individuals versus other individuals and it needs to stop. Um, and while we're talking about directors, you know, I don't know when the last time you spoke to Crystal, but I, I've seen it, I've gotten emails from individuals on the lower end of the org chart regarding this situation. And it is a pervasive problem that I think has gone on for way too long. Um, and I, I'm pretty recent to this council and the fact that I'm able to see it and witness it and see how it impacts people's lives, you know, in the, it, it, you know, you need to put your foot down on this. Um, also, with the city council, you know, with regards to directors, Mary Peretti uh, has been charged with executing the, the will of the council, right? Like, she, when we pass an ordinance, she's supposed to fulfill that ordinance. Michael Yoon, the late councilman Michael Yoon, passed an ordinance in 2019 to change the lot right next to Coco Bakery to a metered lot. That hasn't been changed to a metered lot and it became a big issue. That's one. Two, there's a lot right next to the Central Avenue Parking Authority. This is the post office. It used to be a public lot. I have spoken to the mayor about it. I've spoken to a few of the higher rungs in Parking Authority about it. I don't wanna start, I've never fought with Director Peretti. I don't want to. But that lot was not made a private lot through the council. So she's doing what she wants without even consulting the council. And it's crazy because she used to be a council member herself. And she took out all the meters from that lot. 
the residents in that area are wondering why the postal trucks are parking there. And she made them parking spots for her, whatever her pet people that she like on the top rung of the parking authority. It needs to be liberated or I'm gonna liberate it myself. Like I'm gonna, she put private trespassing signs around it. And this is, it just like is a spit in the face to the residents that, especially in the Heights that can't find parking. And it's a spit in the face to the council. It's just, you know, I, I would really appreciate if you could get a handle on these things. The, the personnel issues, the, the process you laid out is not what's being followed because ultimately the director is stopping it from happening to people that he or she may like and Crystal's hands get tied. And that's what's happening in the real world. Okay, let's go to the next division. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Okay, communication and in information technology. Okay, so this is Bob Baker. Uh, it encompasses everything from, uh, everyone knows Bob's been there running his horse for a couple of years now after we had some people that didn't run so successfully. Bob does a, uh, we're very satisfied with his job like anybody, we want him to do more, but he's doing a pretty good job. The challenges mainly out there are hiring because um, our salary structure is very low for everyone, you know, for 911 operators and for call takers. And in addition, state requirements for training make it very difficult for us to hire someone, sometimes spend six months training them, and then they could leave if they want to to go somewhere else. The, set, the next challenge in uh, 911 is to, as the laws have changed to become more worker friendly, for instance, the Federal Military Leave Act, or Family Military Leave Act, uh, those laws, while laudable, are not really compatible with a center that must be open 24 seven like a 911 center. So what we're gonna have to look at is overhiring to ensure that people are there. If the federal law requires us to let people just not come in at the last second. So, and that, and it does. Right now there's no two doubts about it, it does. And um, we've went through every lawyer in the world. They all tell us that we have to follow it. So we're gonna have to probably look at overhiring. On the good part, uh, by the end of this year, we should have consolidated all of the old operations at Bishop Street into the new building that we're building. We will finally consolidate the computer-assisted dispatch system so the police and fire are operated on the same uh, channels. Mm -hmm. And that should alleviate some of our problems moving forward. So his problems over here on the 911 side is pretty much manning the terminal. Let me Check. ask you something you said about the salaries. So the minimum salary there is 36? Yeah, 36, we've raised that. So what is it now? And I'm just, because it just says 36. No, we raised it to 36, it used to be even less. Oh. Yeah. And you can move up as you get. Now, 36 uh -huh. is starting, no experience. We have targets as you hit. You uh -huh. do four months with us, you get an automatic raise. You do so, you keep moving, we get an automatic raise. Uh -huh. But we probably, when we come in for the budget, are going uh -huh. to be proposing a higher salary okay. and a higher work requirement. One of the things we're doing uh, that is our plan this year, next problem, is the interface between emergency and non-emergency uh -huh. in that. We get a lot of, cons um, we yeah. all know we get a lot of complaints from constituents. Mm -hmm. I called the 911 center, nobody answered. Mm -hmm. Everybody remembers last year was oh, the right. famous one. Uh, it's not true. Mm -hmm. We don't like to call our constituents mm -hmm. untruthful, but everything in that room, everything is taped from the second the phone starts ringing to videotapes recording what everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. It's so mm -hmm. important that every second from an employee enters in there, they're on video and audio tape. So when someone calls us and says, I called 911 and no one answered, we can immediately tell whether they called, how many rings they let it ring, whether they hung up, whether they were called back. And inevitably what happens, and it's common to people in distress, is they think they're on the phone longer than they are. So like the one that received all the attention, I wish Councilman Solomon were here, he and I did a big investigation of it. But somebody called and swore they saw a fight, I called, nobody answered. They only stayed on the phone for three rings. 
we're required to, to answer it within five. That's the state standard. If we don't answer it within five, it automatically yeah. goes to the next yeah. operator. He let it ring three times and hung up. To him, it probably seems like a lot more at the moment when he's watching a thing. When we called him back, he didn't answer because when we looked at the phones, by now he's filming what's happening, so he's not answering his phone anymore. So when we called back the number that called and wasn't answered, because that's automatic also, if somebody hangs up on us, we automatically call them back. He didn't answer. And so it wasn't until the second time we tried to call him that we finally were able to get a hold of him. Now the scuffle between the two homeless people was over, and he said it's too late, and we moved on. That's kind of common when we do an investigation of those things. And putting all the audio and video helps us bring the people in. Like, he didn't want to come in, but we brought some people in and actually showed them. Here's your call. Here's where you hung up. Here's, here's where we called you back. Here's everything else. So one place, though, that we've discovered that our citizens absolutely are right was in the non-emergency line because they would call the non-emergency for non-emergencies, not wanting to tie up the 911 line. And the way the city had it set up was the non-emergency line was answered by the same operators who work 911. So if there's an emergency going on and they're tied up on 911, nobody's answering the non-emergency. We still have it recorded. We still know when you tried to call, but they're right. Nobody's answering that call. So one of our goals this year that we have um, someone in my office working on right now, we've been interviewing people, we want to sever the non-emergency from emergency. Put it in a separate location. We're actually going to, if we pull it forward, if you can, I don't like to jump, but since we're here, if you'll go to the back, you'll see on the second page from the back something called Call Center City Operations Center. And there's no names, there's just positions. Looks like this. Call Center City Operations Center. We got ambitious once we decided to do a non-emergency call center. We're going to try to do it correctly. This stems directly, and since it ties into the call center, I'm on the same thing. This stems, actually, the impetus for this was the night of the flooding, the recent night of the flooding. Uh, I went into fire headquarters on the recent night of the flooding. Tawana went to headquarters. Uh, we had so many 911 calls, there was no chance for anyone to answer a non-emergency number. In addition, every phone in fire headquarters was going off. And people were calling the, because they couldn't get through to 911 and they couldn't get through. Newark bounced thousands of calls to us that tied us up. So we decided at that point, as I talked to people the next day who we called, who we took care of, because what we ended up doing, believe it or not, was I would answer the phone, take down the person's emergency, call Bob Baker on his cell phone, and have him dispatch it. It worked, but it wasn't effective. You know, it's not the way it's supposed to be. So we decided then we have to sever the two. That's where the idea came from. So then we got ambitious, and what we'd like to do now is we're going to set up, and we have already started the interviews, and we have already discovered the space, but we're going to move it into the new building, a call center city operations center. The city's growing. The city's getting more complex. We don't have what almost every city this size has, which is a 24-hour city operations center, where, where you can call, where the mayor can call, where you can get an update on what's happening in the city right now. Right now, people call the 911 center, but that just increases the problem of people being too busy there. So we want to set up a call center for non-emergencies and at the same time have it be a 24-hour city um, operation center. There's going to be three shifts. We don't have any, the 12 um, spots are just placeholders because we have to see what our workflow is. We're not going to need the same number of people on the midnights as we need on the day tour and on the 4 to 12 but we want to get all non-emergency calls into the city to one phone number so that our citizens aren't trying four or five different phone numbers if they want parking or if they see a building violation or if they see a disorderly group on the corner but don't want to disturb 911. So we want to do, we want to set it up, do a big public information plan, and from that point on, every call comes in. The non-emergency calls get a log number, get a callback number, they're handled or they're assigned to the appropriate thing, the person is called back and told your complaint was either handled with these results or it's been assigned to so-and-so at the buildings department. At the same time, we're going to have logs of all these calls. So again, at the night of the flood, 
yourselves, the business administrator, the mayor has one number that they can call, speak to a director and say, what's going on in the city right now? If we've all been in the position where we see police and fire, police cars flying toward a location and we look and say, I wonder what's happening. One place that you can call without disturbing 911, without interrupting the people handling the jobs, one place where you can call and say, this is council person, whatever. I just saw cars on Grand Street, is something going on? <laughs> and we get an answer. Now, most cities our size have had this for decades. So we plan to do that, and that's how we plan to help Bob Baker on the 911 function. So his 911 operators will solely be 911 operators. How we're going to handle the Newark problem, I don't know, because um, it's a human life problem. Somebody long ago committed that we would be their overflow if they can't do it. They absolutely take advantage of us. But by the... We could. We could. I mean, that's a, that's a decision. That's a <laughs> Need the mic. Yeah. Um, so, Director, um, on, on a given shift, how, how many 911 operators are available? Uh, I don't have that offhand. That depends on what, how many, it depends on anticipated business. So the 4 to 12s and the, and the beginning of the midnight has more than the late midnights and the day tour. But the day tour in the morning, sometimes we hold people over because it can get very heavy as people are going back and forth to work. So I'll get you the exact numbers that come up, but it also depends on how many people come to work because of that FMLA Family and Military Leave Act. We almost never have as many as we'd like because what we'd like is to have everyone covered plus extras. So do we, is there a minimum threshold that we need oh, yes. to operate? Oh yes, there is, but we run into the same problem as anyone with the 24 hour operations, corrections, anyone else, is that that means we have to order people to stay sometimes. If four people are supposed to come in and three call in and say I have a family emergency and by law you can't deny me, and our minimum is three, and now we only have one coming in, we have to call people. If we don't get volunteers, we have to order two people to stay and work the shift and just keep working trying to get somebody to come in. So it, it's a challenge at any given time. So is it, is it a fair assessment to say that, um, because I have also been getting the reports that people have called 911 and they didn't pick up. Um, so is it fair to say that that's, that's almost impossible to, to occur? Other than, I mean, not counting the people that, that hung up, but for the most part, either they pick up within five rings or on five rings, or they receive a call back. Yeah. I'm not going to use the word impossible. <laughs> I'm going to say yes, everything, if you call 911, if the phone is not answered within five rings, it automatically goes to the next operator. It has to. It, it, this is all documented, all what if anybody is calling you and saying, I called not, what we usually find is either what I said, they hung up the phone before we could have answered, or they weren't calling 911. They were calling the unofficial, the um, non-emergency number, in which case it can ring for more than five rings. So what I, the only thing I can tell you is, anyone who calls you and tells you that, grab us immediately, we'll immediately start an investigation, we'll have an answer for you within an hour because it's all documented and it's just pushing computer keys. They tell us what time they called and what the address was, and we'll tell you exactly what happened. I won't say impossible because there's human beings involved. So, for instance, the night of the flooding, I'm sure. I was talking to people myself on, who called the fire headquarters, and they were saying I can't get through on 911, and I'm sure it did happen because of the overflow of jobs. But on any, even then, I'll be able to document it. I'll be able to see where they tried and gave up, you know, and hung up. It'll all be documented. And, um, yes, I have the mic, it's, it's my turn. <laughs> um, so what is the procedure for someone who calls um, and, and they hang up? Let's say, instance, um, I call and I hang up, it's an emergency and a phone die. What is the procedure, and the phone dies, what is the procedure um, with regards to the department? To how do they address that? or is you don't address it. Uh, that's kind of an edge case. I can't, like, you'd be, we need someone to be calling. We don't answer, and their phone dies before we can make the call back. If that happens, the best we can do is try to go to the phone company and see if they have a location on that call, a tower. Then we'd have to look for the caller. The closest thing I know of to that didn't happen here. It happened somewhere else where two people trapped in a snowstorm in an accident called but didn't know where they were, and they were able to locate them, unfortunately, too late by going to the phone call. That's when they put the GPS in the phones. 
So the GPS in the phones. Okay. So we would have to immediately reach the phone company. They have an emergency number, and we would describe the incident. They would try to get that number and locate that phone, not the person. We'd send someone to that location. Quick question. Um, we had a meeting with Director Moody regarding the non-emergency number, um, and by we, I mean uh, Councilman Gilmore and myself, and we were told that there was gonna be like a touch tone system at the end of the non-emergency call to say like, you know, was this person respectful? Were you satisfied, X, Y, Z? Is that still in the works? Um, because I think it would be a great idea if, it, if this was still gonna happen. Yeah. It we do want to put that in. Uh, I, I'm not involved, and she might be more involved than me than because she does a lot of the fiscal in how much that it costs us, what we charge. We do have that on our watts, where after you do a job, you can grade, you can grade the city on this. So we're into that because it gives us good feedback. And a lot of times um, we identify performers who need additional training <laughs> through that system. Director, I just want to backtrack with the Newark situation. So is this a form of mutual aid that we're providing to another municipality? Yes, it is. And we don't go to Newark. We go to, um, if we overflow, you know, we go to the Hudson County Sheriff's. Right. <laughs> like to the county. That's our overflow. And we never hit them. We never have to go. We never have to go to them. We man it. We correctly do everything else. Uh, multiple times in the summer, uh, the Newark uh, overflow has occurred to us. Bob Baker always notifies. He gets a notification at home. He notifies me. Uh, the flood was the first time it really impacted our ability to deliver services or had a negative effect on it. Usually it's just an inconvenience. It makes, us, it makes all people work a lot harder than they should have to. But uh, th that's, again, so for I, us to I do that, us, that's, that'd be a decision between you and the business. I team. think us as a council, we need to come up with that ordinance to... We amend that we no longer provide that type of mutual aid to another municipality that has a few hundred more cops than us, and uh, something that we I didn't I didn't know about that. So, it's been going thanks. on the whole eight years I've been here, but it's sporadic. Yeah, that well that was the worst. That night of the flood was the worst ever ever. Problems around you. <laughs> so, Rector, going back since we were um, before we jumped into the the new call center, we were talking about the communications, right? Yep. Under Bob Baker. So, probably since I've been in office, I've been asking for um, a system similar to the fire system when events occur in the city. Because I'm sorry, Councilperson. Asking for a system? Uh, similar to the fire system. Like when there's a fire, I get a text message. And it says there's a fire at this location. When it escalates to a second alarm, I get that. If it's a third alarm, I get that. So we were looking, since I've been in office, we've been asking for something similar from the police department. When we had our uh, meeting with Director Moody, I mentioned it to her again. And she did reach out to Bob. And I noticed that Bob is working on something because now, um, Periodically, we get a, te a text. Um, it's not working great, but he's just starting it. But who does it for the fire department? Is that somebody that Bob can tap into to figure out how to make it work for the police department? Yes, but remember the two. This will be fixed when we put the systems together. They're two separate systems. And that existed already on the fire CAD system when they put it in. It did not exist on the police. So on the police side, someone has to actually, you nailed it, someone has to actually type it in and send it as opposed to just adding a phone number to the get out. So that's where, so all that'll fix itself automatically by the end of this year when we combine them both. In the meantime, we just have to get your phone, if you want the, what we call an emergency notifier, we just have to get your phone calls on the emergency notifier. It's not as timely as the fire, because the fire, as soon as they hit the button to send the truck, yeah. it goes out. Whereas here, the person's making sure, okay, our car's going to the right place, then when they take a breath, they're like, oh, let me tell everyone what's going on. So it's, it'll always be a little behind, but it's the best we have until we, co until we combine. Okay. And is that the one that Bob is sending now, or this is? Yeah, that's what we're doing. We're, he's probably looking to make it better for you before, because the com combination will be toward the end of the year. He's probably trying to figure out how to make it better for you in the interim. Okay, okay. What's the next update? The other thing he does is protect us from viruses, so if your computers ever look shaky, he's the, he's the guy you call. 
I don't understand what he's doing, but he always manages to do it. <laughs> he might be putting the viruses in first. <laughs> That's it. And then, and then rescuing us from it. Okay, Public Safety Division, Quality of Life. Everyone knows this is um, a new initiative last year under Municipal Prosecutor Hudnut, authorized and created by the council last year. Uh, the idea was um, to take our um, could be functioning better quality of life team and place it in direct contact with the prosecutors who will prosecute the cases and don't let anything against our serial offenders slip through. And it was placed under the municipal prosecutor, Jake Hudnut, because um, he's ultimately responsible for those prosecutors. So for example, uh, what was happening previously was we would send quality of life out to a condition that say somebody here reported. Say you reported a um, landlord without heat, not giving heat. They'd get a summons. It would go to the municipal prosecutor. No one would tell the municipal prosecutor who was handling that summons whether this was a one-time event or whether this is a repeat offender who consistently denies his people heat. So we wanted to bring it all together and have a coordinated uh, attack on these quality of life things. So, Danny, we got to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry. So the office, um, it's based around the Resident Response Center, which you'll see Chris's name in there because we're going to have him pull that into our new command center, our 24-hour center. Again, we want all resident complaints to come to one place when we're done. We also want to improve the tracking of the complaint. So once it comes in and is assigned to someone, we want it kind of like Watts to where you can track it anytime. So if somebody calls you and says, I called about this landlord with no heat, here's my log number, you can either call or just get on the system and see who it was assigned to, whether they went out on it, what's going on. And you can call then me and complain if people aren't doing the right thing. So anyway, the leadership is Jay Cudnut, and he's broken down initially into his office, his original office, the municipal prosecutor, that's run by Gabe Manzo and his first assistant prosecutor. She's a civilian who runs the administrative side. He's the prosecutor who runs the legal side. The resident response center is still under Judy Riley and will be until we combine. And the office of code compliance, which is our inspectors, are under Joe Barra. And they're all listed. And then on the next page, questions? Yeah. Um, so resident response, you said you want them to be part of this new call center. Yes. Right? Okay, so those employees will be included in this new call center division that you're, that you're creating. Yeah, we, we foresee, just so when we do the new call center, some of the, uh, I should have just said, we foresee our non-emergency people, resident response, our parking um, call center people, because people call parking directly and mm -hmm. say there's a parking problem. We'd like to bring them all into the same location with one phone number that you're calling at all times. And this way, every complaint gets logged. Every complaint is logged and tracked, so we know who's calling. Because to be honest, we also have the, I called 10 times and it's not 100% accurate all the time also. So this way it's better for everybody when we're trying to investigate some of the things like the councilman mentioned before that he wants me to investigate. The more data we have, the better we can do at investigating. Are we looking to um, expand the quality of life division and have some uh, officers out at night? Because a lot of the problems, quality of life problems are occurring at night and the police don't respond to quality of life problems. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, I was gonna get into that in the police side, but yes, we're looking to expand the quality of life problem, but that's gonna require police officers as well as civilian inspectors because um, as it gets darker, the different issues of safety and everything come, in, come along. Right now, if you'll look, when we form this for Jake, if you'll go to page Jake, I'll call these Jake's pages because he put this together. So if you'll go to Jake page five, you'll see that like a lot of things, um, we formed the quality of life task force, but we just gave Jake the existing people who were already doing this. So Jake got one lieutenant and two police officers, all of whom are excellent, but that's not a lot to handle all the quality of life things going on. He also got on the previous page all of the code compliance inspectors. So all those code compliance inspectors handle the quality of life complaints. He's been working on 
cross-training them. You see many of them now have safety inspector, which means they've been cross-trained and can do multiple different things instead of sanitation, can only do sanitation, health can only do health. So we have many, he's got plenty of safety inspectors, but with all the complaints, we run them out there quite a bit, and we're going to need, if you see in his darkness, his additional supervisor by two, that's the four to 12 in the midnights that you were talking about. And we're then going to need six additional inspectors to do that, and we're gonna need additional police officers to go out with them on the midnights. So that's, um, Director Moody is working on where she would pull that, you know, where she could come up, because there's a couple other priorities that she has that are conflicting with what we wanna do here. Is there um, any plan for having sanitation inspectors in the evening because literally regional industries is making a mockery of our city. I woke, I, I went back to my house around 2 a.m. There's diapers, there's cans everywhere. Yesterday, Columbia Avenue, there's like trash littered everywhere. They, they act like they're in the Olympics and throwing the, the trash in the truck. Do we have sanitation inspectors? Are we gonna have sanitation inspectors in the evenings to follow these trucks? Right now, that's what the sanitation inspectors are supposed to be doing, but I share your frustration. I live in the city also. My block looks like that many times. I have to call Jake. The only thing I would say is, um, the, uh, I call Jake, I walk around my neighborhood, see a problem, call him, he sends someone right out. Until we get some more inspectors, that's probably the best we can do, because in addition to following the trucks around, uh, I just had a meeting with the recycling and that's a huge initiative that we're federally, under federal law, we have to send people out to do a certain amount of inspectors. That also falls under sanitation inspection. Uh, commercial establishments using the regular sanitation, that falls under the sanitation inspectors. So they're just, I don't like to use overworked, but they're, they're strongly worked right now. So the best thing, we, we do have people following them at night. Please call us and report what you're seeing so we can look for patterns and see if we have one truck miss, you know, Problem being, I'm, I'm sure you know, we're even looking into whether we should take it back because, because uh, every time we put it out to bid, one company bids. And that company then has no incentive to do that much of a better job because they, they know that the next time the contract comes up, no one's bidding against them. Yeah. So we might need to create, and that was another thing that came up in these. Um, we need to. In the uh, recycling meeting was that it might be a way to put a wedge into that company if they know we're picking up our own recycling, which actually we can make money on. Uh, they would also know we'd have the capability to flip a switch and pick up everything if they don't do a good job. So these conversations are happening, but to your thing right now, we are supposed to be following them right now. If you see a problem, let me know so I can find out. I can't guarantee every employee, let me find out if my people aren't doing what they're supposed to do. They need to do a better job, or we need metrics, we need yeah. something. Um, also, you spoke about Chris Kearns um, putting all the resident complaints into one place. Um, would that be available, publicly available? Would that be available to planning and zoning? Let's say someone's trying to go for a variance, but they're a slumlord, they don't put the heat on. Like, that's something I think that should be uh, publicly available. Yeah, the goal would be, um, it would be right off the bat, the first thing we want is one phone number. If you get on Jersey City and start Googling now, there's numbers from the 1970s that don't even exist anymore. And we became aware of that frustration that night of the floods, because pe I talked to people and they told me, I Googled and it gave me this number. When I checked that number, the number's been disconnected, the building doesn't exist. So we wanna clean, we wanna get one number, clean all that off, get our citizens used to, but to short answer your question, it wouldn't be there to immediately fix that, they would forward that to the appropriate. So if somebody called about a zoning violation, it'd be logged in, like every other citizen complaint, forwarded to buildings for the zoning, and then it would have a log number, so if you got a complaint from someone it wasn't followed up, you could punch in that log number and see what happened on that complaint. I meant like if they were, let, let's say they were like a slumlord and then they want to demolish the building and make, you know, upsize it basically, which is what's happening in the city, that would planning or zoning department be able to access this information or is this something that... It's not gonna be, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, other than we're gonna have to train them, everybody knows, uh, unless it, reaches legally protected information, which is somebody calls that phone number mistakenly to report a sex crime or, a ch or something involving a juvenile. <laughs> Unless it's legally protected information, city agencies would, the idea is that city agencies can just look up the log number and say what's going on or an address. 
and say how many complaints came in at this location. Kind of what we used the what's for when we were doing the crime or the quality of life. We'd punch in an address and see how many complaints came up about that. And we used it to close down a couple um, alcohol establishments that were developing trouble. That's the same theory. What's next? We're going on to uh, parking enforcement, which has already been touched upon. Okay, uh, I made note of Councilman Sala's complaints. I'll look into them and, uh, or I'll see if I can talk to Crystal and see what she's got coming out of there and see if our information matches what you have. And if there's a discrepancy, we'll get together and see where the discrepancy lies. Uh, in general, our, thing, our problem with parking is going to be uh, we need more. <laughs> we need more parking. And that's because over the last two years, it's been impossible to hire anybody. Bottom line, with uh, COVID, people have made more money than we can offer them by staying home. Uh, we have 50 public inf uh, parking enforcement officers. That's nowhere near enough. We probably need another 50 minimum, and that's without getting into a lot of the traffic that people want us to do. Uh, people want to, which I'll talk more later about how we're trying to, we, we're going to try another goal of ours this year is to try to create a traffic division, which parking will be a big part of. But we need probably about 50 more. Uh, so you can create a yeah, I'd like to. I, well, if that's in, if you want to, we'll talk about it right now since we hit it with parking. Very last page in our folder. Can we just pass the mic? I'm sorry, Councilperson Bajano. It's we got to be on the record. That's all. You know, we never had a problem in this city when we had a real traffic division in the police department. And uh, that's why I was saying we got to bring back the motorcycles. I know you're against it or Phillips against it, but we have to bring a real traffic division. When they created the parking authority, they screwed the city up and they screwed all us residents in Jersey City. It should go back to the police department and uh, it's a shame what's going on. Because one of my biggest problems in Ward C and I assume the other wards is parking traffic violations, uh, non-enforcement of the laws that are going on. So uh, I strongly suggest, and I want to meet with you again and the unions and sit down because uh, we have to, something has to be done. I mean, I live here and I'm getting disgusted living here, being honest with you. Director. Oh, okay. <laughs> so with, with respect to the traffic division, I'm just going to touch on it. I'm obviously, uh, like the councilman said, we're, we're looks like we're not going to get the motorcycles back other than the mopeds, I guess. That's what they want to put out there. So, uh, but this council passed a resolution with, uh, with horses. Are we going to get the horses back as part of the, uh, are we going to get the horses as part of the traffic division that we, that this council passed? Uh, the horse is a simple answer. Yeah, we were moving forward on that. Uh, Director Kears was ta had taken the lead on it, was building stables when COVID hit, and suddenly everything got frozen. So if, if the COVID wave, as it seems, has gone past to the point where we can build, begin construction again and begin talking about training, because remember when COVID hit us, it didn't just end construction, it ended all police training. Nobody was willing to train anybody from other units. We couldn't go to Newark anymore and ask them to train us. So we still want to get a mounted unit, not just for traffic, but also for the waterfront, for the pedestrian plaza, and for street fairs or in parks all around the city. Because so that they're, um, they've been proven to improve community police relations, that people are willing to approach them more often, that they have a better police presence in parks and things like that because you can see them from far away. We're very excited about it. We just have to get running up again. So, so we want to make sure that the areas that you said, we want to make sure that the south side is included, you know, with, with the horses as well, uh, because that's important. And, uh, and when I say it's important, because you, you, you said something that's extremely important with community, you know, relations. You know, if the horses bring out a different type of uh, atmosphere and attitude, especially in the youth. 
and uh, in that type of engagement with, with an animal, you know, uh, it brings out positive conversations within, you know, within our police department. So I'm happy to know that, you know, our mounted unit, you know, once, uh, once the COVID regulations simmer down, I'm happy to know that they are coming back and, and that's important. But we want to make sure that uh, we have them throughout, you know, the city. So, uh, the only ca caveat I'd make to that is when we initially did our study of where we can use them, uh, we have to consider the physical environment. And in the south side of the city, the parks are the places that we can use the most and where we can get the most visibility and the most community interaction. If there's too much traffic, vehicular traffic on a particular street, or if the street is too narrow to ensure the safety if a driver has to stop suddenly or get around it, makes it very difficult to deploy. So our initial deployment would be probably to the parks around the city, especially when they're in use and when a lot of children are in there. Just a few things. Uh, again, parking enforcement, the attrition in that department is insane. And it has to do with the toxic work environment that's happening there. Um, and I do hope you speak to Crystal off the record, on the record, both um, regarding that. Um, and I know individuals who have tried to get positions within the parking authority that it takes months to onboard. I don't know if that's an HR problem or a parking authority problem. Um, so that's an issue. Additionally, when we're looking at enforcement of the zones, they're not enforcing the zones at all. Um, so if you get a permit, literally it's just a tax on the, on the people. They're not enforcing zone 16. I can tell you that for a fact. Um, people go there to get their, like I'm gonna tell you what's happening. They run out of permits at the parking authority and then they print out a slip to give to the constituent. Then they have to have someone call them to come back to get the actual permit. And it's just a redundancy of efforts and it's a waste of money because they're not able to purchase the zone 16 permits. And then when you go out on the street, sometimes they only get seven tickets an evening for the entire city. So you're just losing money as a city. Yeah, it's crazy. And then when it comes to when they chalk the vehicle, they might do it like a few thousand times a month but they're not coming back to put a boot on it. They just chalk it and then they, they don't come back. There's the, the enforcement is nil. I've gone into the Western Slopes. I've gone all, I'm born and raised in the Heights. I went and there's New York plates, there's Pennsylvania plates, there's trucks, there's all these cars because it's a lawless atmosphere. And then, like I said, the parking lot right next to the parking authority. We need that changed back to what it was because it was done without council approval. And then the other lot that actually got changed to a metered lot with council approval hasn't been changed to that. I just, you know, there, there's a lot that needs to be done with the parking authority. It needs like an exorcism. It does, sir. Yeah, parking authority is a problem. It really is. But you know, I wanted to ask you, um, I just want to put on the record, I've never ever, like I've bit my tongue because I've been trying mm -hmm. to get through everything, you know, trying to do the proper channels mm -hmm. and I'm bringing it to you because you're the top dog and mm -hmm. you know, the only one between you and the mayor like that can do something. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something? Um, <laughs> <laughs> do, we, um, do we track track data um, with respect to something that um, Councilman brought up with respect to citations not being issued to, 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 those, to those individuals violating. Um, and because I know we have a drastically different issue on the South Side. It seems like everyone is getting tickets and in multiple cases, individuals are getting multiple tickets for the exact same violation. So do we have any data that we're tracking to see how many tickets are being issued versus where they're being issued at versus who is issuing those tickets? So from the parking side, the way um, we do it, obviously she's got the parking people who have to go out with the trucks, with the garbage trucks. They go out. If they're on the garbage routes, they issue the summonses. 
we should be able to track those summonses by summons number when they get entered into the court. I'll find out that answer for you and get back. But there's no reason. They have to be entered, so we have to be able to track them. Uh, the next major driver of parking tickets, because um, of the reduced people we have with us, we have then, let me go back to the beginning. Once we're done with the street cleaning, which is a priority, we then have either walking posts in commercial areas, or we have parking people who respond to citizen complaints 24-7. Used to be the police department, we moved it to parking. Those citizens' complaints are all logged in. So I, from you tell me where someone got a ticket, and I do this for the mayor all the time, you tell me where someone got a ticket and usually claims I didn't do it, I can find out not who, because we'll never say who complained, but I will be able to tell you someone in the community complained, called it in, specifically gave that car in that location. The parking attendant, the parking officer then takes a picture before they issue the summons of the violation because we were accused all the time of lying. So now we gave them all phones with cameras. Before they write a summons for the violation, they have to actually take a photo of the violation. Certain violations at night because of the parking problem, especially in the Heights, we ask them to try to give discretion if they can unless it's a driveway, unless it's a hydrant, unless it's a crosswalk or a bus stop. So sometimes people are more angry about different things, corners and stuff. We'll try to let people park because of the parking problem. Same on the west and the south side. So short answer, if you've got someone getting seven summonses, yeah, call me up, let me see, let me track those summonses, find out if they're all coming from the same person, or God forbid, they may have a neighbor who's a bad neighbor who's calling every time they park close enough to their own house but a little close to a hydrant, you know, or something like that. We've had, and sometimes that we can fix too. We can go out and talk to the people and say, hey, this is someone who lives on your block. A lot of times, and someone mentioned the cars with the Pennsylvania New York plates. Mm -hmm. You know, like I do, that a lot of them live here. <laughs> and the cars are just how effective is the cars the, are just um, registered somewhere else. So we can usually solve it. So how effective is the license plate reader? Because they had Well, tech. that's coming in, what we call the park mobile. So do, do we use it or is it coming? Coming. It's oh, coming. Oh, it's not because, here yet. No, because we have to bring it in. We have to be able to do that should replace all the council person's questions. Uh, park mobile. So we don't have it. Park mobile is going to be a system where when you get a permit or a parking permit now, you no longer need a permit. Your license plate for your car will be entered into Park Mobile. Every night, we will send cars out with the uh, parking readers, the plate readers, like Hoboken does on the parking. And if you, don't have a par if you don't have an appropriate permit and you're in that zone, it will automatically, as the car passes, it will write a summons and the driver will just have to put it on your windshield. There's no human, human um, interaction. So the the guy can't, excuse me, he can't help his friend. He can't ignore something. He has to issue the summons and we can worry about it later. That's what we're trying to bring in this year. They had some problems with the computers. I can get you an upgrade on where exactly we stand. I thought I had it here because I thought it was the actual parking thing, but she explained it to me. Park Mobile should solve most of what we want to do with that. Okay. How would that address people with the special parking passes, like a day pass? We're going to have to put them in the system. Like when they get a special park pass, we're going to have to enter their plate in the system. And one thing that is a weakness, it can't read states. So if somebody, God forbid, has the same New York plate as one of our residents' jersey plate, it's just going to think the car belongs there because it can only read numbers and letters. But yeah, the day pass people are going to have to purchase their day pass, and it's going to have to be entered into the system with that day so they can say so can only stay for that day. In the zone I'm in, I don't know what number. It's near the college. I get two visitor passes that people can put in their car. So that's not really a day pass. They belong to me, but I'm allowed to give them to someone yeah. if they're parking because they're coming by to visit. Yeah, that's going to have to, we're going to have to figure out how to account for that. That's, uh, I'm sure she, I'm, you're not the only one, so I'm sure she knows that that's an issue. Let me get back to you on what the plan for that is. I saw your note, and I have also heard this. Why are there some people within the parking authority with the PEO title, but they are not PEOs? Where's the... Uh... There's a note on the employee list. Oh, yeah, the employee I have also, I have heard that there were people with that title, but they were not sworn in as a PEO. Yes, because um, I'm aware of our people now. When we ended the CCTV, mm -hmm. and we had to try to find jobs for all the employees there, 
uh, several of them chose jobs as PEOs, came over and were incapable of passing the physical. So they were given the PEO title to come over because we had to give them an equal job with an equal salary. When they couldn't pass the physical, we assigned them to clerical duties until we find another job somewhere in the city for them to do. Because uh, I know there's, well, one is working in Mary's office as a clerk. We have a couple others that went back and are working as clerks in communication. But we can't change their job title on the computer until we decide what their new job title is going to be. Yeah, there's civil, well, that's, there were civil service CCTV operators. That When we ended that title, we couldn't keep them in that title anymore. So several of them chose to be PEOs, but got over there and either once they did it for one day said, I can't physically do this, or when we sent them for the physical, the doctor said they can't physically perform the duties of a PEO. So we have to find another job for them. Just pass the mic. I have one more. With some complaints from teachers that are at schools that don't have parking lots, they were unable to get a permit to park um, through the parking authority. And I saw some email exchanges with principals that had to, you know, submit pay stubs with people's personal information yeah. on them uh, and also write really lengthy letters to justify to the parking authority that that was an employee. Is there a way to streamline that, that, uh, you know, the Board of Ed shares a list with the city and those people are... Okay. It's not about I'm going to have to you. get back to you on that because I know that's a very complicated subject and um, there are various ordinances and rules that sometimes say someone shouldn't get one. If there's a spot available, for instance, and we, we said there's disputes sometimes with the school over how many spots are actually available. I know it seems like we should just be able to go there and count them, but there, there's, it's more complicated than just, oh, they can just write a letter because the people who live around the schools frequently complain about the teachers taking up parking also, and we have to be cognizant of that also. Parking like traffic is one of those things where there's not one side and the, a fix, there's usually two sides. Like I said, most of our complaints about parking are from neighbors, people who live next to each other. Can we get a better organizational chart for parking enforcement? That's one. Two, it doesn't really have their salaries and there's been issues with the salaries in parking enforcement where certain people have been there for decades and they haven't gotten a raise and other individuals who are the basically class pets essentially get the raises and the promotions and the titles and um, so I'm just concerned about this chart because it really doesn't show anything it's really poor quality and um, uh, we put that together today when I got the email last night about this. But yeah, I'll get, you, I'll get you everybody's salary, but I will say the city just went through a pretty extensive salary leveling, and I'm going to be shocked if anybody is too far out of whack with anybody, with anybody who's performing similar duties, because I know we just went through like a year-long thing to prevent that. Uh, I haven't been in charge of the parking authority for decades. I know many people claim they worked there for decades. It was an independent authority, you know, yeah, before I got there. Uh, any allegations of unfair or disparate treatment that people bring to you, just forward to me and Crystal to investigate, oh. and let's do a full investigation before we assume the worst on them, because um, in other divisions I've had sometimes mixed stories. We'd be able to see in black and white, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah, but again, I'll get it in black and white, but again, we just went through the salary leveling, so they have to. I know everybody right now has to be within the correct bands. Also, the parking enforcement number, is that a recorded line when a constituent calls in with a complaint? Because I've heard that, uh, well, I've actually been on the line when I've heard very terse response. Um, no, I... I don't believe so. I'll check. Um, I'll see if I can legally record that if it falls under my, like I can legally record everything in the emergency op, in the emergency dispatch, no yeah. problem. I'll check if legally I can record a non-emergency number without the permission of somebody on the conversation. So uh, that's there's legal things. I'll get back to you. I'll let you know whether we can or not. Now every call in, if they give a parking condition, should generate a watt. Okay. And then we should, though, Watts is off right now because we haven't paid them another COVID hangover. But it should generate. So I know anytime someone made a complaint to me and said I called and they didn't do anything, I was able to immediately see if a job was generated. Yeah. 
you know, by that call. And then I know, and now I can go back and see if a phone, because it does tell me, I have phone records on whether that call came in. So if I have a call that comes in and no job generated, I have a problem, <laughs> you know, on the thing, so. No, I just want to tell you that parking in the Heights is literally my kryptonite. So that's why I'm very, very sensitive about it and I want something done. It should be a plan. Just, just we need to go ahead. With the uh, Watts, Watts works very well for Parking Authority, but it still has the police department up there, even though the police department isn't using it. Can we take that off because it confuses residents? Some residents are still using it, and they're telling me the cops aren't responding. At Mike. We're going, to, we're going the other way. We're putting it back up everywhere once we get it paid for. The reason it was taken down by the previous chief, who's no longer there, uh, claimed it was a safety issue, investigated, determined it had nothing to do with the safety concerns he had. But then again, before we could get it back up, suddenly the entire city shut down, you know, for two years and we haven't been able to put it on. So it's a priority of ours. One, we have to pay them. Now, they give it to us free because it was designed by a previous council person. All we have to pay for is our storage fees, which are pretty minimal, like $40,000, but we haven't paid them. So I know Chris Kearns, who's project manager on it, told me they shut it down last week. They work with us, we'll get it back up. And then we're gonna expand it so it count, covers everything again. Because it works for us because we can track it. We want every citizen complaint to go in there because we then know from the second it was called in to what happened, we can track how fast the people responded, everything. Can we, um, because before it was connecting the parking authority and to police, can this now, because some of those issues in there are quality of life issues, can it now connect to, once we expand that quality of life task force, to some of their inspectors instead? Short answer, yes, once we're 24-7, because we don't want people to be doing it and we don't have the capacity. So we figure we'll go to the police until we're 24-7. Okay, I, I just want to move on to the next one, but when it comes to parking authority, um, could you um, send us some type of updated plan to revamp that division? because you can see all of us have a serious problem with parking authority. Well, if you see on the back again, I mean, if we get our way and if we get a break from what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. we plan on subsuming parking into a traffic division. Mm -hmm. So parking will just be one part of a traffic division. <coughs> but it's part of the morale too. I, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna linger on parking because yeah. the truth is though we got other divisions and we need to go, get to fire. Yeah. But part of our challenges as a council is parking authority. Parking, now. school traffic, yeah. All of that you. is a problem. So we want, we really, we really want that department revamped. Mm -hmm. We do, because um, we getting, we getting a lot of complaints. Rich said dissolve it, but that's not the right answer. You know what I'm saying? So we definitely want that. Um, we, we want parking authority dealt with. That's our concern. I just want to echo the council president's sentiments that, you know, I think that there needs to be a leadership change there. Um, it starts at the top. I was going to ask you if all of your directors are mandated to be in the office and if they all are in the office and if they are required to sign in and if we're keeping um, checks on that because, you know, parking authority, I don't think that that director has been in the office enough. I don't know, are they required to be in the office? Uh, parking is in the office and out, and before we get too deep into this, I would hesitate to um, say too much about things that are being said unofficially to us when there is an official way to handle all these in a documented, fair, due process manner. If there is a complaint about one of my directors, there is a way to handle it that it is- I thought that's what we were public, doing. The entire public okay. knows what's going on, and it's done with everybody's due process covered. Is this because not closed people, session? Or is this, this not no. closed session? People, people tell me many complaints about people too, and what I do with them is I call Crystal, and I say log this complaint in and begin an investigation, and that can be of a director, anybody. Okay. Crystal Fonseca, she handles this. But no, that's no, that's no problem because this is a public forum, but we cannot say that we have concerns about a certain division and the concern of the leadership, and we can answer that 
you know, you can come back with a different plan for parking authority because that is our concern. That's it. We don't have to say names, but we know that, it, no, we know you didn't, but I'm just saying it for the record that um, you can come back with a different plan because that is our concern. That is a complaint that we get from the residents of the city of Jersey City, which, you know, they call us and email us and that is all public information. So, so parking authority, we can, we can sure. investigate any complaint made to anybody. Right. So nobody has to give a name. We don't need yeah. to give a name. No, 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 no we just saying, saying in general. If somebody call, if, I'm just, so let's move on and fire. If somebody calls with a complaint about anyone who works for me, we don't need to know the name of the complainant. We don't need right. to know anything. You forward the complaint, it gets a log number, mm -hmm. it'll be investigated, and the right. results of the investigation will be reported to you, including any discipline, if there is any. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a very timely manner. It won't linger for okay. forever. Okay. Uh, fire department. We'll get an update. Yeah, fire department. Uh, if you see the thing, uh, Steve McGill is our fire chief. Uh, we have 10 deputy chiefs currently, 31 battalion chiefs, 142 captains, 479 firefighters. Uh, I'll tell you right off the bat, um, fire is, we're, we're comfortable. We're comfortable with where we are right now. However, as the city is expanding, we're starting to look forward to um, the city growing and saying that we are going to need to probably create two new fire companies over the next couple of years. Whether we're all here, I don't know, but we're gonna probably, Bayview, as Bayview builds, Bayview is not going to be able to be covered by our existing fire coverage. We're gonna probably have to put a firehouse in there. Uh, I guess we'll call it north of the Holland Tunnel, that whole community that is developing in there, north of the Holland Tunnel, right now is covered by the firehouse on Marin Boulevard, which is well within its response time. But as that community continues to grow, we foresee having to put a firehouse in there too. The advantage to that will also be by the quirk of Jersey geography, that area is the only one that can get to the waterfront without crossing the light rail tracks. So we'll finally have a firehouse, even though it has to go a little longer, it won't get stopped by a train. So our plan on the fire department um, those of you who've been supporting it for a while, you'll see, is to continue our slow and steady expansion so that when it's time to open a new house, we're not saying, oh, we need a new firehouse. Now we have to start from scratch, hiring people, promoting people, everything else. So, for instance, out of our last 199 work days, on 101 of them, we were able to put out an extra fire truck. So we had enough personnel that we could man an extra truck, put it in an existing house, have exist, helping, have extra, we put it on the south side of the city where we have the tightest group. Uh, as we increase the ability to man that, we'll be ready when we have to open a house to just move that unit into the house, assign personnel, and move forward. So our real problem with fire right now is not a problem, it's a luxury, is that we're planning for as the city continues to grow and move forward. Uh, well, director, I just one second. Um, yeah, the other, my only other issue. Sorry, I apologize. My only other issue with fire, uh, least diverse organization in the city, because I know that's important to a couple people here. We've been doing it for eight years. Uh, we're doing better. We we just had eight eight promotions: four to captain, four to de uh, battalion chief, and we got two Hispanics and an African American to captain, two Hispanics and an African American to battalion chief. Put us a little above our numbers, but we know diversity is important. Uh, we're still maintaining our board to make sure that nobody is getting knocked out of the um, fire classes because of any reason, especially if they're a Jersey City resident. We just overruled our investigators on one this time to get a young man in who we think deserves the chance who they had rejected. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, slow. We're stuck with the civil service list. Um, our, my main problem is the firefighters themselves. I'm doing better on the promotions, we're doing better on preparing people, but our percentage of minority firefighters has maintained, uh, in, from when I started in 2013 to now, uh, we've went from 30 to 35 percent. Not nearly as much as we've succeeded in the police department, not nearly as much as we've succeeded everywhere else. It's just very tough to get the applicants for the job. We need help with everybody on that, we're doing better, we have a full-time recruiter, uh, but it's just very tough. It's, it's proven tough to us. We hope there's a solution, but we haven't found it yet. So, so Director, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. With, with, when you mentioned the diversity 
with the, with the uh, African American and Latinos. I think it's important, you know, I think that's important, but I think more important is to have the most qualified person, you know, it, the most qualified person in yeah. that position. So, you know, we just want to make, I just want to make that clear. My, my, my concern with, uh, and I have a couple of concerns with, with the fire department, uh, and, and, and I love my, you know, myself, Councilwoman Waterman, we've, we've, we've been here uh, the longest of all the council members, but collectively, th and, and, and Richard Bogiano, but collectively, uh, old and new council people, we kind of like, we're proud that, you know, we have been behind the advancement of this, you know, fire department and, and, and police department. We've promoted more than any administration ever in the city, of, in the history of Jersey City. So we're very proud of that. With that said, I'm, I'll just talk about the area that actually we live in the same area. Uh, my concern is with brownouts you know, that continue to happen, you know, within our fire department. Just recently, uh, the, 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 the fire station in our area that covers our area and was, was, was browned out. And that's a ladder company and an engine company that services the entire Newport area and services uh, the east side of, 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 of the city to the waterfront with engine two, which is only one engine there. So this whole area that we have here uh, from 18th Street up to Washington Boulevard, Dudley Avenue there, we have one engine, two engines, a ladder truck and a high rise apparatus to engage in any type of uh, fire that we can potentially get. It worries me when we get browned out and those companies get closed, you know, within our area, especially covering such a dense populated area. We have to be very careful with that. And with that said, is it that difficult? Because I know I'm going to touch on one subject, you know, with respect to uh, police overtime. The fire department gets no overtime at all. So because of that, sometimes we have to brown out houses. Is that, can you explain that to me? Uh, first, overtime is for operational purposes. We need it, we spend it. Uh, browning out a company, the circumstance you're describing to me where we, we the claim is that we browned out both um, trucks in a house, uh, I'd have to investigate that one because the fire chief has assured me that that's never happened. That companies get browned out. Now, here's why. So, COVID started two years ago. And one of the many things we immediately had, I think originally out of our 500 and something, we had over 200 sick on COVID. It was raging through the department for a lot of reasons, the close quarters, the staying together, et cetera, et cetera. So, the chief put into place a policy, and I approved, and I think it was the right idea, where we stopped any contact between different groups. So we have four groups. One works one day, 24 hours, then the next, then the next, then the next. We stopped them moving from each other because we didn't want them to cross-contaminate each other. We wanted any COVID case to remain solely in that group and not allow it to explode. Because even doing that, we had over 200 out. If we allowed cross-contamination, we already had a plan put into place where we would have to start possibly not answering certain no emergency aid. So with the help of that plan, we never had to put anything else into place, but it did mean that if a company called in sick, we couldn't call people from another group to come work because they would potentially cross contaminate if there was COVID. So that led to some brownouts. Then we stopped them. They went away. Now, one of the things we did was we have a contract that says uh, the, a lot of the problem was fire captains. A captain would call in sick. We wouldn't be able to replace them. We'd have firefighters to run the truck, but not a captain. We decided to use acting captains under our emergency authority, people who were already on that shift but didn't. We'd have minor cross-contamination from one house to another, but not from group to group. The union sued and stopped us. The union challenged us, said you can't do that. Uh, an arbitrator agreed with them, 
despite the fact that there was a state of emergency. So we said, okay, we can't do that anymore. We had the arbitrator said, you just have to brown the house out. You can't keep it open with an actor. That was the union that did that, not us. We tried to keep it open. The brownouts went away as COVID knocked down and as we knocked the thing out. Omicron hit. When Omicron hit, we went to over 300 out sick in a fire department of this total size. So we had to reinstitute. We had, a, we had went back to, we can cross, you know, you can cross, you can put, bring people in on overtime if you have to. So we went back to that, but then Omicron hit. When Omicron hit, the chief again said, no more cross-contamination. He put the measure back into place. No more mutuals between tours and no more bringing people from overtime to bring tours. If somebody is infected on one tour, we want to limit it to that, to that group, to the best of our ability. And that led to us having to brown out a couple houses. I think the worst we have, and by the way, let's remember, uh, Sickness appears to increase on Saturday and Sunday. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I'm just going to point out that when we look at the brownout days, illness appears to be much more serious on Saturday and Sundays. Whatever. Whatever. So, bottom line, we're out of that now. The chief has, I believe, either now or this week, plans to rescind the no cross-contamination order because we've dropped our sick level down enough to where we think we don't have, we're not getting that contamination again. And we're back to, we haven't had a house browned out in ages and, and days, I mean, or weeks. And we're now usually putting out an extra truck. I've hired enough people that forget browning out, I should have an extra truck out every time if I don't have excessive absences. In addition, when we were facing this, when we went into the last contract, we told the unions, this is a problem for us, the excessive absences. We, we can't plan, we don't want to have to brown out. We don't want to, if you remember, I know it's easy to say now the fire department overtime is down, but you were with me in the first year when they ran out of their overtime budget in the first six months because they were giving everybody off who wanted off. And we weren't getting extra fire trucks, we were giving people off for all that money. So in the last set of contracts, we asked the union, can we guarantee you that we will maintain, because their question was always, oh, if we guarantee to come to work, you can just drop the number of fire. So we said, what number would you be satisfied with? We'll guarantee we maintain that number. On fire captains, I believe it's 139. We've got a couple extra now. But we'll guarantee we maintain that number. And you guarantee that on every tour, 27 come to work. Now, what that does is, that means I need 108 over four days. I've got 142. That leaves a lot of people to take vacation, to take off, to take everything else. One of the things that we said to them when we all agreed, we agreed that we'll keep the number, they agreed that they'll come to work, they'll stop taking off at a certain time. We said, if you get to that number and somebody calls in at the last moment and claims they have an emergency on Saturday again, that battalion chief is gonna have to decide whether to give them the day off or to tell them no, come to work. Because by union contract, you have to come to work. So come to work. So if a battalion chief decided that the person's emergency was so important that they would brown out a company, that's the only other way it could happen except for COVID. And I don't believe it happens because, again, usually we have the extras. But over the last days with the Omicron, there's no question we browned out houses we didn't want to. I just got to, like, I'm very proud of the fire department. Chief McGillow, I think he's great. And the fire department is really good. But, you know, being with the police department and knowing the statistics, we have in the fire department 183 supervisors for 479 men, which means about 2.45 su uh, men for every one supervisor. That seems way out of whack. When in the police department, it's like one for 10 or more. I mean. Yeah, but Rich, and now you, you, you and I are cops, so we're arguing one way, the fire department would argue another way. But to be true, they're different jobs. So in the fire, in the fire truck, there is a guaranteed supervisor per four people on everything. Then we need a battalion chief. We need a safety officer. They're not fat on supervisors. They, it seems to be from what you and I are used to, where one sergeant can handle eight cops, you know, out in the street. But fire's a different animal, and they need to do their job effectively. We're comfortable, you know, at these numbers of supervision. And if anything, we want to make sure they have the correct supervision to do it. And I understand your concern, and when I first looked at it, I thought it was heavy too, but I've learned that it's not. It's correct. I want to circle back to the uh, diversity in the fire department. 
diversity in the fire department. So we did, um, I guess it was maybe about two years now, it was before the pandemic, create a position for Dale to work on recruitment, one of the firefighters. What exactly, have we given him the tools to do what he needs to do to improve recruitment? I know when we did that in the police department, it worked really well, but I don't know if we've given that same energy to fire. Well, we've given him, we put him in contact with the police recruiters, gave him the same office space with them, access to their lists, because they go out and talk to all this stuff. To be fair, there hasn't been a test since then. Like, we can't really, the, the state shut down, and he hasn't had an opportunity to bring anything forward, so we're still working off the old lists. Okay. Uh, we'll see what he can do with this one. We also still maintain that board of um, firefighters, um, firefighters and fire officers who review all of our candidates and make sure that they're, you know, being pushed forward if they exist. And quality, if you're not even being considered if you're not the correct quality. I agree with uh, Councilman Rivera. If you haven't passed the test, you gotta pass the academy, you have to pass all the, you're not even being considered. We're just making sure that people are getting the fair opportunity to go and do and prove that they can. But if you don't pass the test, you're not getting on. Nobody's ever dropping a standard. Same in the police department. With the uh, promotions, because I got a, a few calls last week. You know how it goes. Once uh, something happens, everybody calls and has questions. Certifications. When we do certifications for uh, on these existing lists, right? That comes from us contacting the state and saying we want to certify 10 people on the fire captain's list, right? That comes from our end. What we do is, um, yes, you're 99% you're right, and okay. I didn't understand this either. What we do is we notify the state, um, because a lot of times we don't even have, you know, who's available. We notify the state that we would like to promote, um, last week, we'd like to promote four battalion chiefs and four captains. They certify as many as they want to. Sometimes they'll certify a couple extra in case somebody quits, in case somebody turns it down, they don't want to have to do double work. So they're liable to send us back six and six. We have no control over that. All we can do is ask, we can't promote someone unless they're certified. So we have to tell them we want the next four and the next four. And if they send us extras. And they send extras. Yeah. Okay. Because that was some of the concern with, of course, if we did 10 certifications last week, which was what they're saying, we did 10 certifications, then everybody on the list 10 through 20 is now calling asking for more certifications. Um, if we do or have the capacity to extend some of those certifications, we do get a, a little more, uh, I guess, diverse pr promotion pool. I don't know what the capacity is for that. And it also helps with our issues of having to have ap acting captains instead of having real captains. Yeah. So I don't know. We, you know, we how never that have all acting captains out. now. Uh, yes, we were like, we just did it. We just went beyond what we're legally required to. The way we do promotions in the fire department now, and everybody likes it, and except. If somebody gets close, I understand it's sad, but um, we go one for one. We have, we, both us and the union agree how many are needed. The fire chief agrees, everyone agrees this is what we need. When, when someone retires, they're replaced. When someone retires, they're replaced. So anyone on the list knows pretty much when they're gonna get promoted. They, they know I'm four away, I'm five away. The only exception is, and make no apologies for it, the mayor and I are committed to diversifying and to making it more representative, giving people in Jersey City an opportunity. If we're close and we see like this time, that if we promote an extra three, we get three minorities and can increase our, we'll go ahead and do it and we'll have the extras and then we'll, we'll, we always find something for them to do. There's, it's, yeah, fire is dangerous. I just wanna reiterate what uh, Councilman Ridley just said about the diversity. We should go to the colleges, the universities and you know, uh, the high schools and sort of, you know, do career fairs and be there for looking to get more minorities. Um, my question is regarding the census, you know, our population has grown. Are we compliant with the safer number so that we can continue to get grant funding? We're over. We're over? Okay. For the, first, for the first time in my eight years here. What they require us to be working toward it because they know it's not always easy to find applicants to train them. So we've usually been trying to get there and they've been very good with us. Uh, but for the first time uh, this year, we hit the safer number and went over it. So the federal government already certified that we're there. That's awesome, thank you. Um, and then the, my second question is, do we have enough fire inspectors? Just because there was a spate of uh, fires in the Heights and all over the city actually, there was like a, uh, a few ki children that got killed, um, I believe was it MLK? I forgot exactly where, but 
this was last year, um, do we have enough fire inspectors to check like uh, the, these uh, conditions? Yeah, we have two types of fire inspectors. We have full-time fire inspectors, and we also offer it on a per diem to our firefighters. If they want to make extra money, they can take the test, become a fire inspector, come in and work it. In addition, our fire companies go out and do fire inspections, residential. So like, and we never issue, let's say some, a homeowner, you want to tell them, why don't you get your house inspected? We will send the company out, our fire company, they'll inspect the house, they'll give recommendations, they will not write summonses. They'll give recommendations and tell you how to fix it. In a lot of cases, we'll repair it for you. If we see um, the computer strips that are fire hazards, we'll take it and give you a fire rated one. If we see that your fire um, alarms or your CO2 alarms are not up to date, we will give you and install them for you. Chief McGill does a, he, he put that program in and it's been phenomenal. He uses money from corporate fines to go out and help homeowners. So anybody can request that for any address and we'll go out and do it. And again, there's no negative for the homeowner. We'll help you fix it. We will not issue you a summons for anything. The only negative would be if you're a slumlord and if nobody should be living in there because it's dangerous and it's about to collapse, then we're going to have to find you a different place to live. But Thank other, you. Than, other than that, we're good. Last department's the police department. Oh wait, can, can I give you a quick CCTV? Because I know everybody's interested first. So uh, CCTV, um, I will pass, I will make copies of this and get them to you to distribute to everybody. And it is our phases of CCTV. So it will show you, so everyone knows. And by the way, this is public information, it's been in the newspapers, so you can, but it will show you each phase when we completed each phase and what corners we put, what corners we or parks we put cameras on. So I'm going to get that to all of you. The bottom line is that our last phase six was completed in October 2021, and we're now on phase seven, which I think the funding is coming to you. Can I remind everybody? We do not use city funds. These are forfeiture funds that we get the we submit to the prosecutor where we're going to put the cameras. It's approved, but. Um, the mayor's policy is that even those funds come here and be approved here also. So you'll vote on them and you have the yes or no, but the funds don't come out of the city. If we vote no, the funds go back to the prosecutor's office and we have to try to apply for something else. So we're, we have 10 that we're um, proposing to put on phase seven, which we plan to be completed this year. Uh, Millennium is um, actually, no, you don't have it, you're gonna get it. You're gonna get it. And here's the one that you're all going to hate me for, our future location wish list, <laughs> which is, um, you can look, this is what we've identified as 96 more locations that either the community has asked for a camera or the police have asked for a camera. It's not in priority order. Because as you know, every time we do a phase, we reach out to all of you and see if anybody has something they want to talk about or anything else. So for instance, this phase was approved by the last council the one that's going to be complete, that's to be completed, this was approved. Our next phase will be selected from these 96 with your, with your input. Okay. So we'll get all this out to you, and again, nothing is secret. Uh, we, we don't put in hidden cameras for the public. When cameras are put in, they are told to every community group, and they're announced in the media that cameras are at that location. Mike. I have the mic. I can give, I can give him this one. Okay, do we have a, I've, I've asked multiple times for a camera audit for where the functional cameras are, um, especially in the Heights, you know, I don't know where all the functional cameras are. And we should do a camera audit if we haven't done so already. That's one. Second question um, is, can we make all the cameras visible like online so people could stream? So then we could have, you know, individuals in the community could be able to view what's happening on a corner, you know. Uh, no, they've had, they, other communities have that. I mean. Where, where is the other mic? Where's the other mic? The, the first thing, yeah, the first, no, but the, the, the first thing, um, your first question, the audit of the cameras, when I give you this phase, um, and I'll give her this copy tonight, and then I'll have another copy sent over to you. You can distribute. When I give it to you, any camera listed here is operational. They're checked 
all day. If they go down, we're immediately notified, they're immediately repaired. Any cameras that existed before we took over and began this project, so pre-2013, you can assume are, unoper you know, are inoperable because they put in bad systems and they did not keep up and repair them. That's why we started from scratch and began building our own system. So the cameras that you'll see here, which were well over 100 by now, and the ones we're gonna put in are all operable 24-7. As far as streaming, I'm not spending the money on that. So if I get money, I'm putting in more cameras. So I'm not putting, <laughs> that's, so we'd have to, you'd have to do it some other way. That's right, get the mic. If the public can access it, then if there's somebody who wants to do harm, they will know how to hide. Think of it that way. <laughs> Director, I have a quick question. Um, we're, we're on the policing, and I, I, I just want to go back to uh, when we spoke about Elise being the the person in charge of the off-duty job program. That's my office. Oh, that's your office. Oh, the, so she's, let me, because. Mike, Mike. Oh. I, I can't, I can't. She, yeah, now you can't have it back. <laughs> so Elise Jordan Gibbs is physically located in police headquarters, but she's in my office and answers directly to me. Okay, my apologies. And I should have asked that question a long time ago. I would have been home already. <laughs> um, so. With respect to that, the jobs, how are the jobs for the, because listen, we had a meeting here with, with Director Moody, uh, uh, the EXO, Nicola, Nicola, Nic Nicola Flora, uh, Sergeant Goodman, uh, Denise Ridley was here, uh, I was here, you he was here, e Edgar Martinez was on the, uh, Edgar Martinez was on the phone, and and one of the statements that uh, that Director Moody said was, uh, Councilman, you wanted these jobs back, but people are calling out just to work these jobs and then not work in their regular, you know, position. That's what she stated. But my concern is, when, when the past that the past council, uh, when Councilman Rolando Navarro and Councilman um, no, Jermaine Robinson was here. We passed the ordinance, and the ordinance was that we were going to, re we recommended a software to be purchased so that they don't have the, the same problems that they're going through right now, and that software has been approved via ordinance, but it hasn't been done. So I, 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 when she told me that, I cringed a little bit because I said if, if we had that software, she would not be going, or at least would not be going through the problems that they're going through now with calling officers and, you know, like, uh, like she said, she was, they're going crazy because they have to call everybody down the line. Where if you have a, uh, a software that has been proven, you know, in other big cities that it works, why aren't we using that if that was a recommendation from the city council to do? Yeah. Uh I, I bow to no one in my hatred of the off-duty work and the various things that have happened um, connected to it here in Jersey City and the advantage that was taken by some people. We'll leave it at that. Uh, we're, That's well, in the past. We're not 100% we're not be. I wish we were. Uh, bottom line, um, we bought it back. Uh, it's there. It's a little bit of a problem for Lisa and them now. Uh, Director Moody is testing software for both roll calls and or that will cross into off-duty and also cover your availability for off-duty. It'll also handle the roll calls when people come into work, when they're scheduled. Uh, so it'll be one system instead of two systems. That, that's actually amazing. If we get, let's, but she's testing it. Let's see, we gotta get it in. I know her, she had a proposed start date of January of this year and it didn't. So there must be a bug or two in the system. Because th that will eliminate 100% of what we had in the past. You'd like to think so, but uh, I'd 99. like to 99.9%. <laughs> you know, the past is the past, and you know, you speak to the cops. A lot of them aren't getting called for off-duty work. They, I don't know who's running it, but I hear a lot of complaints. And uh, no, what do you say? And it's getting to be sickening. I'm tired of seeing state police here in the city here. They don't belong in this city. 
and uh, the jobs belong to the cops, but the people running it have to know what they're doing. And uh, believe me, Director, uh, you know, I've been around a long time, and uh, you get tired of hearing the same problems over and over again. But number one, the state police have to get out of here. Number two, we have to have the department with off-duty work run more professionally. Just so we know, we're not moving the state, the state, unless we move out of the state of New Jersey, the Jersey State Police can come here. But, but however, but however, uh, and I'm, I have problems, I've, I've heard the, um, nobody called me, and every time, every time I've investigated it, it has not been true. So maybe that doesn't mean it's not, but again, I would encourage that officer, because if an officer thinks they were skipped and didn't get a call, they should report it, not to you, but to the person who can investigate it and do something and make sure they're compensated if they didn't. If they did get skipped, they can be put the next one in line. Okay. The ordinance also states that every job that's being done by, the, by any outside contract within the city of Jersey City should have Jersey City police officers first. That's why the councilman is having chest pain with the state police. Come in here. Well, then have them answer the, uh, the accident calls on the state highway. Have them answer the, any of their roads, uh, all right? So Wait, do, I'm not, you know, listen, I'm a former cop, you're a former cop, you know where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm with you, but this is why I wish we could end the whole program so we could know if we see you in uniform, you're working and we can make you work. But we'll get through this, I think. Um, much better, and hopefully this new system Tawana wants to put in will solve whatever problems, and uh, which, and listen, right off the bat, I'll, I'll prove to you that no one would be hiring the state police if Jersey police were willing to do it. We're cheaper. So Point you tell inquiry. me your company is purposely choosing the more expensive thing. It's not true. They're going to them, they're going to them when nobody from Jersey City will take the job. Or in very rare cases, and I've looked into this and explored it, if it's a multi-jurisdiction job. It's easier if they're starting in Union City and going through West New York and into Jersey City, it's easier for them to get a state trooper. Sometimes that's what's going on too. But there were a lot of problems that you identified early and worked with someone from my office to try to clean. We cleaned a lot of that up and this is where we are now. Thank you. Point of inquiry, are we, are we still commencing the off-duty jobs or what's the status on that? Have we done any off-duty jobs or I know the stop, but has it begun again? Stopped them in about a, over a year ago. We restarted them again in a much, um, much more disciplined, smaller way. So, uh, okay. A lot of the problem we and putting putting a stop to the problems eliminated a good percentage of the jobs. They weren't necessary in the first place. Uh, so, there are no jobs for homeowners. Like, it's only for companies and construction companies and stuff now. Nobody can tell a homeowner you have to hire a jerk a police officer if you want to repair your okay. sidewalk. So that eliminated a good bunch of the jobs too. All right, I have uh, two questions. One is regarding the, the number of units in the Heights. So every location is supposed to get six units. I know you run the police department based on need, but it's been frequently happening where the Heights gets the short end of the straw. I have an issue at 1212 Summit, which I told Director Moody about last year. This year, you know, I brought it up again, um, and she had assured me there'd be six units. Um, I just want to make sure that they're not removing the sixth unit because I need the post there at 1212 Summit. I get a call on Christmas Day. There's people exposing themselves to little girls. Uh, they're taking poops and peeing right there on Sea Caucus Road, on Summit Avenue. It's a very disgusting, deplorable situation that the residents have had to put up with, and I need that sixth unit, you know? So I just, I support police. The people in the Heights support the police. They want to see the police, but it's, we keep getting shortchanged, and you know, the, the residents want to see the police up there. They want to see what their tax dollars are going for, you know, and it's not, it's not a good situation. Yeah, I, I thought I had 12-12 Summit. I know Tawana just put two of her newer cops, you know, out there on a permanent post. 
because the person just complained. I just saw that. I thought I still had the email. The one thing I'll say is, um, listen, we start with six cars in each thing. Uh, I cannot take from the deputy chief, the commander-in-chief of the city, if he or she needs to move resources based on what's happening in the city, they have to have the ability to do that. Uh, the Heights is quieter. So you're right, they probably move the resources out of the Heights to more busy areas more than we would like. But we can't take that, we cannot take that ability away from, we can't just say no, those six cars have to stay in the Heights. So if, so if there was just a shooting somewhere else and we now have to control the crowd and try to get kids out of there safely, we're not gonna do it and we're gonna leave the cars in the Heights where nothing's happening. It's frustrating, I understand. Uh, the, that kid is getting scarred for life. Pardon? Like that kid, that girl is gonna get scarred for life seeing a grown man's genitals. Like it's not, it's not appropriate. It's, you know, I think it's just as damaging as, you know, gun violence, I, I would think. I just, you know, and there's been armed robberies in the Heights as well. You know, Manhattan Ave and Tunnelly, like a few blocks away from me. Like I just, you know, we need, we need our units up there. And again, we and the, have them, okay. but I can't sit here and tell you that they're not, they're not gonna be moved if the commander in chief on that ship feels the need to move them because of what is happening. Who's the, the commander in chief? Is a city commander in chief on every tour, it differs. It's either a chief or a captain. We're about, we're about to, we're, we're short chiefs right now, so there's captains, but they're excellent. They know what they're doing. I trust them, they move people around. They then have to explain why. They don't just do it on a whim. They then have to leave a report why they moved people. Uh, go around, but it, it happens. We sometimes have to do it based on conditions around the city. I don't want any crime to happen to anybody, but for me to sit here and tell you that I can guarantee it won't if I leave six cars here is not true either. So we need that flexibility. Bottom line, we're trying, and Tawan is on it, is um, Director Moody uh, is on it, is we need to hire more police officers. We, we have 900, but I don't know where they are. Like, I want to well, see. I can tell you where they're, where they're all out. They, um, no, there's 900. On every shift, and there's been a heavy sick. With the, with the latest COVID, we have had, again, about 300 out of those 900. Yeah. But I can tell you where um, everybody's assignment is. You want this? Um, you know what? All right. Fair. All right. One last question on fair the crossing point. guards. But after this, just crossing guards. No, but fair point. Um, if the council president is amenable, I'll also, when I give the locations of the cameras, the assignments just by number of where police officers are, so you can have a feel for where those 900 officers are. I think we should have did police first. There's so many questions um, I have with regards to um, police. Um, I guess I do like, um, there's a few things I like about the police department. I like the fact that we're becoming younger and diverse. I'm starting to see a lot of people, um, young, younger individuals become police officers. I am a little concerned with respect to di diversity in the higher ranks, um, i.e. lieutenant captains and uh, commanders and things like that. Um, I'm trying to figure out what is the rationale or what is the ideology behind the lights flashing all day? Does that deter crime? Is it a way to make your presence feel? Um, is there any data that suggests that it's working, it's not working? What is the exact ideology or thinking behind that? Uh, the thinking behind that, and I, be, I think you're referring to when we put a car at a fixed post and keep it there for an entire tour. Yes. And why would we have the lights on? That is for visit, th those posts are selected. So first we get to how we chose those posts. Uh, we used to go with a, what, what they called, um, like a modified post. So you'd have two or three blocks to walk and the police officer or the car could patrol three or four blocks. Uh, we got no bang for our buck out of that. They always seemed to be where the crime wasn't happening, whether that was because um, there's a natural tendency as your tour goes on to try to go to where it's quieter or whether it was because the criminals could react to where they saw our officers and go to someplace else, we don't know. So what we did was, in line with the cameras, we went back about 30 years and we looked at violence in Jersey City. That's one of the things John Sabo and my thing did. I did a report to the council last time. And we did a, a report in 30, and we located about seven locations in Jersey City. And we actually did about 15, but there were seven that jumped off the page. And those seven were what we call sticky violence locations. You could put a car there and it'd go away for a day, but you take the car out and it comes back. Other places has a violent op episode. You, like right now, we just had one on Belmont and Monticello. 
it looks like it was a complete outlier. We're pretty confident we put a car there, reassure the residents, we move and it won't come back. Wilkinson Avenue between MLK and Ocean, if we pulled, a uh, captain pulled the car improperly one day last year and we had a shooting, a murder there 15 minutes later. We had a shooting with a car on the block because they couldn't see the car, because its lights were on. And we, I have video of the kids leaving and realizing the police were there and stopping and then realizing they don't realize it's us and thankfully they got away, we caught them the next day. No, but, so we took those seven locations which far outstripped any place else. Like seven, it's a double number eight on violent incidents. Shootings, only shootings and homicides. And we said we're gonna sit on them 24 seven. We're gonna stay there, we're gonna let the residents know. And we told the residents and they agreed, we're gonna let the residents know we're not leaving this time. Because what the residents constantly told us is you come here, you stay here for two days, and then you go. Or you say you have a cop here, but I never see him. So we put cameras there, and we checked if what the residents were telling us was correct. And it was. We were signing people there, and they weren't there. They, you know, they were moving around, they were going to help other cops. There was sometimes legitimate reasons, but the bottom line is they weren't there. So we said, nope, we're going to pay if we have to, we're gonna do whatever we have to, but you are not doing this anymore. We are going to be on Wilkinson, MLK to Ocean 24 seven. We are gonna be on Salah, which is harder, but we're gonna be there 24 seven. We're gonna be on MLK Wade to Warner where we had hor horrific incidents, 24 seven. And I, some of the others I, I'll think of. And we said, we are gonna take those 24 seven, we're gonna be there. We still had some shootings where the police officers, the police car was either, either we made, we made a mistake and gave an unmarked car, it serves no purpose, or we put a police car out there and without the lights on, our cars are dark at night. If they were parked between two SUVs or two vans, the kids didn't know they were there, shot around the corner and started shooting. So that's why we said, you know what? From now on, you must be visible. If you're not visible right there on the corner, you can't find a park, then you put your lights on so that people know you're there and that you're standing there. Now, I've gotten a couple complaints from some community members. I feel like I live in occupied territory. I've gotten a lot more positive. You represent the area. If you wanna come speak about it and tell me that it's different, love to have that conversation because you represent them, you might be hearing things I'm not hearing. But what I'm hearing when I go to community meetings is, would they rather that the problem didn't exist in the first place? Yes, they would. But if the problem exists and if they've been living there, dealing with this, they'd rather those police officers are there. And whenever I'm, we had a community meeting, me and the mayor, and we said to the community, um, if you don't like the post, tell us. Tell us, we'll pull them off, we work for you. We'll pull them off and we'll put them back on patrol. And everyone came up to us after the thing and said, don't. It's, we haven't had a shooting here like Wilkinson, and okay to thing, we haven't had a shooting in a year. When it used to be, one every uh, two or three a week. Yeah, I guess. That, um, no, they're not on the, we're not, it, some of it relocated. I should, I should be fair. Some of it relocated, but a lot of it doesn't because we have two types of violence here in Jersey City. And uh, you know, we've talked about this multiple times and many of you will recognize this. Our shooting violence and our homicide violence. There's all kinds, there's, my, there's domestic violence, there's this, but 90% of it falls into two categories. One, uh, you wanna shoot me. I'm probably gonna get shot. Because you don't care where you do it, you'll follow me, you'll wait. If, you, if the police are outside my house, you'll wait for me to go to work. You, you want to shoot me, you're probably going to shoot me. You're probably going to pull it off, and then we'll do it. That we have to work on mostly arresting you afterwards. The people who shoot aren't that many, we get them off. But the second type, and the type that those posts refer, and it's a serious Jersey City problem, Wilkinson wants to shoot Triangle Park. Doesn't matter who. Doesn't matter who's standing there. We just want to shoot somebody from Triangle Park so we can say we shot up Triangle Park. And most of Wilkinson especially was like that. It was kids coming from other areas, driving around the corner, lighting up whoever happened to be standing there and just driving back and then going on social media and say, check it out, I just lit up Wilkinson. So the locations where we put those posts are specifically to address that second type of violence. Those, and that's what it is. It's, it's very sticky. It's, um, it's groups that don't like each other generationally the young kids today can't even tell us where it started. Curry Woods doesn't like Wilkinson. Uh, Triangle Park doesn't like Wilkinson. Booker T doesn't like Salah. And we've, we've, what we're trying to stop is those type of shootings. And those were the ones that were also getting most of our innocent bystanders. Because if he wants to shoot me, he usually shoots me and goes home. And nobody, nobody else gets hit. 
So that's why we have those posts out there. And I, again, I welcome any input, no, I, conversation. I, think, I mean, the posts, I'm not really so concerned about the, I'm just concerned uh, about the, like taking kids, kids of 41 going to school early in the morning, just seeing a constant lights all the time. I mean, we, if the police are parked on the sidewalk, we can see that they're visible. You know, I, I, I don't think that the lights need to be on. Um, I mean, we, we could argue that case all day. No, well, and another, um, in the interest of time, another um, thing I would like to see is as, 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 as the time go on, how do we uh, look at these sticky spots? Because at one point, Warner and MLK was a sticky spot, but as we all know, the violence either went to the south or to the north, but the, the post is still there. So I guess my question is, um, is it better served, why or why not, is it better served that they have a radius of three blocks, or is it better served if they're fixed at a particular location? I, I will say when we started with the radius, it did not work for us. Inevitably, they were not where we needed them. And um, Warner and MLK, I won't go into the story, but um, some of us remember Warner and MLK was a location where a mother got shot defending her daughter. Yes. Who was, and, and, there was a, and there was supposed to be a police post there. And it was actually the final straw of the fixed, no, you can't have two or three blocks because the kids who were doing it, there was a car two blocks away, and they, or a block. And they had no idea it was even there. It was tucked in between two cars. I won't say it was hidden, but it was impossible to see. <laughs> and it was there, and it was not interacting with the people who lived there, and it was not addressing an obvious dispute, you know, among people there, and it resulted. So that's a touch you want to me now. To be fair, I believe uh, Councilwoman Ridley and Director Moody have both raised moving that one in particular because of the because of the facts. Yeah, because of the drug um, the arrests at a certain location. Let's not. But there was. It was a serious case at a certain location there that they feel may have solved most of that problem. And they've asked, can we move it? And I believe Director Moody, Moody I'm not gonna speak for her, but I believe she is planning on possibly moving that one to another location. Yes, that's Thank still it. Um, <laughs> oh, you gotta wait, Danny, I have, you gotta leave? Police and that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have, I have to go. My, my dad is being discharged from the hospital, so I got to go pick him up. But listen, um, I'm going to be very frank and honest here. And it's just one of the reasons why, you know, I wanted a closed session because there's some things that, you know, not that I don't feel comfortable saying, but I would have preferred it to be done in a closed session. And one of the things that, you know, we as a council and as an administration, when we came in, and you know, you've been blessed to have been working with us since 2013 when we came in. And uh, personally, me, Daniel Rivera, I really like you know a lot of the work that you've been doing, Director. And you know, for Christ's sake, I remember the, when when Terrence McDonald interviewed interviewed me the very first time. He goes, "What's the best thing that you uh, this administration has done?" I said, "Hire Jim Shea." You know, and and I was proud of that. Um, and I still am. Uh, we, 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 we really go above and beyond to, to, to the diversity, the black and brown, how many we've promoted, what we've done for men and women, you know, together as a whole in the entire public safety department. And I, wanna, I wanted to be on the record because I'm just tired of advocating for it and I will not advocate for it anymore. But I want that to be on the record. Uh, we have an extremely qualified person to be the chief of this department that happens to be Puerto Rican. And he doesn't, I mean, I, I, I've, I've heard, I've heard, and I'm not saying names, I've heard, you know, comments like, you know, he's not bright enough, he's dumb, and it's unfortunate, you know, very, very unfortunate. Given the history that we've had, you know, with, with the prior chiefs that we have and, and, and their records speak for itself. It's, it's just unfortunate that we will not give an opportunity to a Latino man to be the chief of this department. And uh, 
you know, it, it, it really it really bothers me. But I mean, Council President and myself have been going talking about this forever, and uh, you know, there, there's got to be a time where Daniel Rivera stop. And I, even with Councilman Borgiano, it's got to be a time where Councilman Daniel Rivera stop, says, "Okay, stop. We're not going. I'm not going to continue to waste my time with this." Uh, but uh, I, I, I th and, and wherever, you know, for whatever reason, he's not, you know, the chief of the department. And I have nothing against Tawana Moody at all, but we've promoted someone who is not in the police ranking file to be the number two person. And we have a qualified deputy chief that happens to be Puerto Rican that is not in that level. I don't think I'll ever know that because I'm not a police officer, so I don't know the, the, the thought process or the thinking behind that. It's just something that I just wanted to get off my chest. You know, it's something that should be, you know, on the record. And I mean, I'll tell you as, 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 as real as it is 6.13 in the evening on February 2nd. I will not advocate for him anymore because I just know that, you know, it's almost wasting my time, but it's just unfortunate that that individual is not leading this police department. I agree with Danny 100%. We need a real chief of a police in this department. Somebody's come up through the ranks. But the very thing I want to speak about is what Yusef said and what he said. I think fixed posts, 40 years experience in, in policing, I think fixed posts are the biggest joke in the world. In the 70s, when we had a lot of problems, I don't think you were around in the police departments in the 70s, Director. When we had trouble, and seven, 69, 70, 71, 72, the 34th precinct, I remember the same thing when we were having problems. We put people in plain clothes cars, three or four guys, and we eliminated the problems. We went around, we got these groups off the corners, we arrested them. The other issue there is that they're arrested and released today, which is a joke. But fixed posts to me is a, a joke. They should be out in unmarked cars, or in cars riding around, or walking posts, getting to know the people. So. Okay. Well, I gotta um, kind of sum this up. All right. Um, what you can do, Councilman, make an appointment with the uh, safety, public safety, because I know your um, area has a lot of concerns, and you just coming into office, so you should see exactly what the plan is there. All right, and make sure you have your input in it. All right, because it would take some time, really, to. Um, for you to really look into your ward. Um, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, and Yusuf, your complaint, one of the reasons we don't have six cars in the North District, because one car and sometimes two cars are pulled to send to the South to sit on a corner. And, and, I, and I think that part of, part of our challenges is, part of the challenge is policing, period. I, I think we have to, I'm not a police, that's why I don't really get that involved, because I don't know it, but I think there has to be like, um, like the council person input because times has changed. Now I know some people agree with the state posting there and some people don't. And that's why I think it, it, everything has to be different and rotated. But I know people have called and said, no, we want a police car there. I, I know we've been doing this for a while. And then some people say, well, they don't do anything. So I think that's why you need to have a conversation. I think each ward council person should have a conversation with public safety to see how their division can function better. And I think whatever can be done, to be perfectly honest, I think, um, I don't, I don't want to say Shea, but Director Shea, he will adjust to do it, okay? And one thing I have to say is when he did come in in 2013, he did change the climate of the police department. To me, the police department is a hard egg to crack because they are cold as silence. There's so much goes on there, to be perfectly honest. And you need somebody from the outside to come in. He came from the outside. He wasn't a Jersey City police officer. He was a New York police officer. And I remember when he came in, and we got a lot of flack behind that. We did. But we wanted something different. And I think that at this day and time, we just need something different too. And I think he's open to it. You, see, you heard our concerns, and I think our concerns is fair. I mean, 
you, you see it from our perspective when we talk to you from a council person perspective. We're not trying to come at, it, at the directors because I know even with this closed session, I know some of them felt that way, but I want you to know that was not our intent. Our intent was to really get this city running. Our concern is parking authority. I have nothing against whoever's on it, but I think there needs to be a change because we get a lot of complaints. I'm here eight years, and that's just fair. That's fair, I'm not coming after nobody, but it's just fair, all right? Um, they have concerns with um, the crossing guards. I know it's hard for us to get crossing guards, okay? Right, now, yeah. right, it's very hard for us to get crossing guards, so I think that's a conversation that, you know, we still need to have to see how we can recruit them. I know it's very hard. Harder than we thought it was gonna be. Correct, <laughs> correct, so it's not like we're not, it's not like we're not working together, and, and that's what I want people to see. We are a team, and we're just really trying to make this city run better. So some of the questions we ask are challenging. You know, Some of the things I'm quite sure not all the directors like, but they have to see from our point of view that we answer to the public, and all we want to do to make this thing function. So I want you to know we appreciate you. The council people will reach out to you. Sean, you can close us out. Absolutely. May I have a motion so. to adjourn at 6.17 p.m.? Motion made by Councilperson Soleil. May I have a second? Second. Okay, tell us. Second by Council President Waterman. On the motion to adjourn at 6.17 p.m., Councilperson Ridley, Councilperson Baggiano, Councilperson Soleil, Councilperson Gilmore, and Council President Waterman. Motion carries 5-0 um, on the motion to adjourn at 6.17 p.m. Thank you so much, Council President, Council Members, Director Shea and everybody in attendance. Thank you, Tracy, as always. And remember, teamwork makes the dream work. Have a great night, stay safe. Did you get this one? No problem. You know the cops do a magnificent job, right? The, the whole cola side, it's, it's cultural, it's not that.